Hello there. In today's video, I am going to be making a war club. This process begins with looking for a suitable piece of wood. If you're not interested in this, you can skip to the carving at 455. Making a war club from a straight-grained piece of wood like a 4x4 doesn't work very well. Wood is very easy to split along the grain. And I've seen a couple of test videos on the internet where, after striking something hard, the head of the war club will just shear off of the handle. To prevent this, you either need the grain to follow the shape of the club, or you need the grain of the head to intersect with the handle. To this end, you need a very specific piece of wood from a very specific tree. The best option is to find a sapling about three inches around with a burl partway up the trunk. Failing that, your next option is to find a tree that has fallen over at one point but righted itself, creating a curve where the trunk transitions into the roots. Your third option is to find a mature tree that has fallen over. You might be able to find a gnarled section of roots, or maybe even a burl. Or, failing that, you might be able to take one of the roots and make it the handle, and then make the base of the trunk the head of the club. Your final option, if all of these other ones fail, is to take a mature tree with a perpendicular branch. That branch is the handle, and the main trunk will be the head. This last option won't work quite as well as the others, but it'll do. So, let's go for a walk and see what we can find. A good time to look is in early spring when everything is melting up. Winter always ends up killing a couple of trees, and the cold prevents them from rotting too much. Here's a large fallen branch. I could make one out of this, but it would be a lot of work. Here's one that looks to be ideal. However, it's still alive. and I don't feel good about cutting down a live tree for something as frivolous as this. A good place to look is in wetlands. Wet ground has a lot of frost heave. This makes the trees shift on their foundations, and the roots grow into weird shapes. This one here would also be ideal, but there's no sense cutting a live one if by a little more effort I could find a dead one that would do just as well. Here's one that would do nicely, but it's a little bit too thick. It would take a lot of work to make that the right size. One of my neighbors pulled up some trees. I could no doubt find something usable in these, but none of it looks ideal. This one here has got the right kind of idea, but it's a little bit too small for my purposes. There's a fair few of them around here, but all of them are a little bit too small to be useful. This one might work, but it's a little bit of a weird shape. This branch would do, but it's a little bit too rotten. This one's got potential, but again, it's still alive. It's important to only pull up the dead trees. This one here looked ideal, but when I pulled it up, the roots turned out to be too flat. If you went around pulling up every tree that had potential, you might end up pulling up a hundred trees before you found one that worked. If you only pull up the dead ones, you're not hurting the forest. Another reason to use dead trees is that they're partially dried already. If you work green wood without following the proper precautions, it might very well warp as it dries, or worse, split up the side. When I'm making a bow or an axe handle, I let the wood cure for a full year before I carve it. Dead wood only has to dry for a week or two. The caveat, though, is that it has to be dead but not rotten. Rotten wood has no strength to it. If your starting piece is big enough, you can get away with a little bit of rot, but you need to be able to carve it all away. The test is to stick your fingernail into it. If it's rotten, your fingernail will go in with no resistance whatsoever. Another place that it's useful to look is on slopes and hills, where erosion might have affected the roots similarly to frost heave. The species of tree isn't as important as the shape. Ideally, you want something that's dense and strong, like oak, hickory, or ash. But softer, lighter woods will also do. You just have to overbuild them to compensate for the lower strength and weight. I don't mind taking my time to try and find the right piece. Worst case scenario is it's just a nice walk in the woods. Okay, here's the perfect piece. Big old oak tree that fell over, and a burl on one of the roots. Couldn't have asked for a better piece. Yeah, that'll do nicely. Just a simple matter of cutting it loose. Yeah, that'll do nicely. Take this back to the workshop and get started. So, here's my starting piece. As you can see, it's naturally grown into roughly the right shape. 
This will save me some time, as all I've got to do is refine it. The first step is to take an axe and remove all of the obviously unnecessary material. You want to be very careful here. The axe is not very precise, and because of how quickly it cuts, a single misplaced blow could ruin your whole piece. The axe is useful for splitting off large chunks of wood. It will always follow the grain when doing this. In pieces with crooked grain, you want to be very careful that you don't accidentally gouge it. With that being done, you want to take off most of the bark so that you can get a better look at the wood underneath it. A draw knife is a good tool for this task. You have a lot of precision with it, and the blade can slip under the bark and lever out chunks. Once you've removed some of the bark, you'll be able to better see what sections are unnecessary. This piece is more than an inch longer than it needs to be, so I'm going to use a saw to take it off. The saw should be used when you have to remove a lot of material against the grain. Here's a root that's coming out of the side. I don't want to risk gouging it with the axe, so I'm using the saw again here. using my pocket knife to remove the rest of the bark. You don't want to cut the bark away. You want to slide the knife under it and then lever it out. Now back outside for more axe work. I'm going to do the rough shaping of the handle here. There's a little bit of punky wood on the handle, but not enough to compromise it. Any punky material that you find can just be removed entirely. Now I'm taking off just a little bit more unnecessary material from the head. Here's a large section that needs to go, but I don't trust the axe to take it off. Now I'm using the draw knife to clean up the handle a little bit. I'm not carving it entirely here, I'm just cleaning it up. The vise is going to mark up the handle, so I do the handle last. The saw left a couple of square edges on the head, so I'm going to use a rasp to round it off. A good rasp works really quickly, and you have a heck of a lot of precision. The only drawback is that it leaves kind of a rough finish, but you're going to sand it anyway. I'd like to talk very briefly about making this sort of video. This video was edited down from over three hours of footage, and it's hard to know how much to keep. What's interesting to me isn't always interesting to my audience. I want the head to be nice and round, so I'm marking a corner that I want to take off here. The way to do this is with successive approximations. Carve a little bit away, round it off. Then you can see the next section that needs carving away. The way to judge if it's rounded is by touch. It's pretty easy to fool the eye, but your fingers are good at finding the corners and the flat spots. Now I'm shaving down some of the high spots on the burl. Something interesting to me is the idea of striking a balance between the natural state of the material and the refined state. If you refine an object too much, you lose a lot of the natural beauty that's in it. However, if you don't refine it enough, it just looks unfinished. A lot of that rustic furniture with the bark still on it looks unfinished to me. However, on the other side of the spectrum, something like IKEA furniture preserves none of the natural beauty of the material. The head is still too big, so I'm going to use a belt sander to take it down. The belt sander is a little bit faster than the rasp, but it has none of the precision. And the noise is just soul crushing. So here it is so far. It's getting close to the right dimensions. Because this is a weapon, it doesn't just have to look nice, but it also has to feel nice in the hand. In this test, it feels a little bit heavy and awkward and hard on my joints. So I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. Round off the corners with the rasp, then make it smaller with the belt sander. Repeat until it's the right dimensions. It's pretty close now, but one side of the head is larger than the other. So I'm using a compass to mark it out. 
One corner of the head sticks out where it meets the handle. To carve this down, I'm going to make a series of shallow cuts with the saw, being careful not to cut into the handle. Now I make a vertical cut in line with the handle. After which point I use a chisel to lever out the pieces. I'm just using the chisel like a pry bar here. I don't want to tap it and risk gouging the head. Now another saw cut to release the other pieces. Now I'm just using the chisel like a slick to clean things up a little. Then back to the rasp. Historically, you'd do the rough work on these clubs with the axe and the chisel, and all the finishing work would be done with abrasion. To clean up the shoulder here, I'm using a square rasp with a slightly less coarse grit. Swinging it around again, it feels a lot nicer in my hand. That feels close enough for me, so I'm going to finish rounding off the head. After a bit more work, the head's mostly formed, so time to work on the handle. The spoke shave is your friend when you don't want to remove very much material. The draw knife is your friend when you do want to remove a lot of material. The spoke shave is better for keeping the handle straight. The draw knife is better for working on curved sections. Now we go to the upright belt sander to do the final shaping and a bit of a polish. You've got a lot more precision with one of these than you do with the handheld belt sander. And it works faster and gives a finer finish than the rasp. Noisy as all heck though. You want to keep it moving against the belt sander at all times to prevent any flat spots from forming. Clean up any loose fibers of wood that the draw knife might have left. I'm using the corner to make a little scalloped section just below the head to further differentiate it from the handle. Then we take down the few remaining corners. Then once over the whole thing again. Now that all the shaping is done, it's time to polish it. I recommend putting on a podcast or something while you're sanding. Otherwise it's easy to get bored and start missing things. So here's the club after sanding. I've added in some carvings for decoration and a carved grip. The final step will be to oil it. I'm using walnut oil here. It was used historically. Alternatively, you could use animal fat, but that doesn't apply quite so nicely as this. You want to apply a coat of oil every couple of days until it stops absorbing more. And here we have the finished club. The grain looks terrific. That's another benefit to using a burl. The shape is a little bit plain. I could give it some more decorative carvings, but what have you. I'm reasonably happy with that. How does it handle, though? You want a club to be light and fast. Pretty good, I'd say. So, that's all I have to say for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye.